Okay, I guess uh, all of you can see my screen. Okay, welcome uh, everyone and a very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, today we're going to look at a very uh, contemporary topic, but although it's a contemporary topic, but this is not something very new. From dawn of civilization, we have always talked about uh, rights, we have talked about survival, we have talked about uh, fairness, we have talked about justice. However, in the process of uh, a capitalist world, somehow or other, all these uh, thoughts got buried. Got buried because everybody was so gung-ho, everybody was so uh, enthusiastic in developing themselves, developing the countries, and, and, and by and large, it was so much focused on wealth accumulation that people forgot. People put human values aside. People put uh, environmental issues aside. People have placed wealth as a more important agenda as compared to our own very existence. So, however, with all this happening, the world has come to a point where it can't take anymore. People have come to a point where people can't take this anymore. So retrospectively, we have to evaluate, we have to investigate what went wrong, right? So the primary focus, the primary forces in a capitalist world would be businesses. So my lecture today is trying to Explain to all of you, trying Attention. to, can you hear me? Uh, your PPT is not move. Sorry? Your PPT is not moved, sir. No, I've not moved the PPT yet. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I've not moved it yet. It's still there. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. I'm not coming to the point that I'm just giving an introduction, right? So uh, when you're looking at uh, the world today, right, the primary force that has led or the critical uh, element that has um, uh, facilitated the wealth accumulation would be businesses. So businesses, as much as businesses serve society, businesses serve consumers, businesses serve market, businesses uh, uh, serve industry, you may find that at some point, at some point, they are also equally responsible in the degradation of humanity, degradation of the world as per se. So we are going to explore what went wrong. We're going to look at some of, some of the theories uh, or, or philosophical thoughts that has brought us to where we are today. And we are going to look at retrospectively, can this be remedied? Can, this, can we overcome this? Can we move on trying to correct the mistakes that we have made in the past. At the same time, we do not also want not to make profit. Profit is one thing. All of you are, I think I believe that most of you are business students here. So therefore, if you're a business student, you should be able to, I mean, one of the primary motive of you being in business is to maximize profit. But whilst maximizing profit, we also have to look at what kind of implication in the pursuit of searching wealth has happened over the last uh, uh, few thousand years to today, all right? So in trying to decipher that, okay, when we talk about uh, accumulation of wealth, there were three phases of accumulation of wealth. The first phase of accumulation of wealth was the, in, in the agricultural phase. This happened somewhere way back in about 8,000 BC when men learned how to they, they, they look at the skies, they look at the weather, they look at seasons, all right? And they found that, actually, if you look at men, pre, uh, uh, prehistoric men, they were nomads. They were hunters and gatherers. They moved from one place to another. But later, when they learned about the environment, learn about the weather, learn about seasons, they realized that they don't have to move around. They can stay put, cultivate, uh, agricultural produce, go into animal husbandry, they can domesticate animals, 
And by, by virtue of that, this was the first dawn of accumulation of wealth. That means agriculture, anybody who were into agriculture, that is their possession. So there was exchange of goods and services between agricultural producers, between um, uh, people who domesticated animals. So that was the first phase. And this started about 8,000 BC, about that. Then came the next phase, all right? The industrial phase, the industrialization. This came about, um, when I talk about industrialization, I'm talking about Europe. Huh? Of course, uh, in some other parts of the world, like China, India, and so on, they were already advanced at a particular stage, much earlier. But here, in modern times, all right, when you talk about an industrial phase, it started somewhere from the 14th century onwards, where new ideas, new thoughts came about. The advent of uh, application of science and technology in trying to automate, in trying to mechanize human activity. So during the early industrial, uh, uh, what do you call it, industrial period or industrialization period, and which peaked in the 18th century onwards, you found that those companies that are able to mass produce and mass distribute goods and services became very powerful. So during the agricultural phase, it was the farmers who were very powerful, landowners who were very powerful. But during the industrial uh, uh, phase, beginning from the 14th century, which peaked in the 18th century, you find you, you, uh, what, we fought, what we saw was um, the, um, uh, the power vested on those, those people who were able to mechanize, who were able to automate production, mass production, mass distribution. So that's how the industrial uh, um, uh, phase came about. That means I'm talking about a shift of power, okay? Then came the advent of the information era, information um, revolution, starting from the 1950s, just after World War II. This was when the first, in fact, uh, as some of you probably know, the first computer was discovered in 1940. It was developed, co-developed uh, by uh, the US Navy and the, um, and, um, uh, an American company. So both of them, all right, and, and of course the purpose of developing this uh, uh, computer was to help the Navy in for strategic purposes uh, during war. But by the 1970s, all right, uh, a computer became, or rather the information age, uh, sharing of uh, what do you call it, data sharing of information became a big thing. And today, we are living in a digital era where we find the internet has revolutionized everything. Today, the most powerful companies are companies that own information, not companies that have oil, not, <clears throat> not companies that are into farming, not companies that produce automobile, not companies that produce pharmaceutical products, no. The most powerful companies are those companies who are who have access, who own information. So I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Your Facebook, your Google, all these companies are very, very powerful companies. And they are the ones who become the movers and shakers of industry. So the way we think today, the way uh, we should think, the way we consume today is very much controlled by these information. Many people think that, oh, we have independent thoughts. How many of us actually have independent thoughts here? No, you don't have independent thoughts because whatever from the food that you consume to the school that you attend, to the job that you're going to eventually uh, go into, all these, all right, are something that has been programmed. This is a uh, uh, program in the sense that you have been influenced you have been bombarded with all these information. So today, one of the one of the best examples is uh, uh, food supplement. I'm sure many of you take food supplement, vitamin C and vitamin D. Of course, you also have your own your your regular food, but on top of it, you take all this. Why? Who told you that your food does not have vitamin C? Whatever vitamin C that you have in your food, your orange, your apple, is more than enough. 
but somebody tells you, oh, if you take vitamin C tablet, it's good for you. So automatically, the whole world jump into this perspective. They believe that vitamin C is good. So somebody is influencing. Like for example, today we have got uh, the era of um, electronic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, EVs, electric vehicles. And I think uh, some of you probably may know that um, one of the biggest player in EV, Elon Musk, met your president. And uh, Tesla is going to, uh, not Tesla, Elon Musk is going to invest big time in, 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 in Indonesia. Compared to all other countries, he picked Indonesia. And that is going to revolutionize your development in Indonesia. So all these are big equations, big companies. But what are the implications? What are the implications of these businesses to you, to me, and to everybody in the world, and more importantly, the planet itself, the earth itself? How and what has happened to them? So the, 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 sorry. So because we are so uh, obsessed with accumulating wealth, we are so obsessed in making more money, making our businesses big, bringing in investment. Sometimes we cut corners. Sometimes we overlook things. Some, sometimes we look the other way. Because when you talk about uh, development, all right, when you talk about uh, progress, it must be a holistic progress. For a simple example, if you're going to build a highway, all right, if you're going to build a highway, of course, highway is good. It's going to make connectivity between point A to point B. That's good. But let's say that highway is going to cut across tropical forests. If let's say it's going to cut across tropical forests, it's going to affect the flora, fauna, animals, critters in that particular area. So do you think it's, it, it, is, it, it provides justice now? What about, let's say, for example, the, the highway is going to affect, let's say, a big farm, uh, uh, farmers. You have to relocate farmers. So it is going to affect the livelihood of people. It's going to affect the, 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 the environmental condition. It's going to affect so many things. But because we are so excited about building a highway, because the highway looks good, we overlook all these factors. So this brings to us one of the pertinent aspects of business, ethical issues. I think some of you uh, would have studied business ethics. And I think uh, you, you probably would know uh, the implication of business ethics uh, in, 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 um, in, in business. So there are three types, three levels of ethical issues. One is at, what is what we call the individual level ethical issue. Uh, individual level ethical issue. Ethical questions about a particular individual, individual's behavior or character. A simple thing like what you do is, when you have rubbish in your hand, do you throw your rubbish anywhere or do you go look for a rubbish bin and throw your rubbish bin? All right, that's an ethical question. Okay, you are stopped by a policeman. All right, because you are not wearing a helmet and then you offer some money to the policeman. Do you think that is ethical? Simple example. But you think it's a small amount. Policemen think it's a small amount. No big deal. You're willing to give. They're willing to accept. No problem. But that is an ethical issue. So you find that all these factors all right, contribute to the way that you think. Is it okay? Is it not okay? All right. So when you talk about uh, 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 ethical issue at an individual level, this is what it means. The very, very basic level. And this is inculcated where? In your family, in your social, immediate social construct, in your school, in your university. The values are inculcated at that level. Now, next level of ethical issue is what we call corporate level ethical issue. These are ethical questions about a particular corporation and its policies, culture, climate, impact, or even action. So how does this particular company behave? Are they doing things that is environmentally unfriendly? Are they producing goods and services that are not safe? For example, genetically modified product. I'm sure many of you have heard about this GM product, genetically modified product. This genetically modified product is a controversial product. 
from the point of view of, a, of, a, of the company, like for example, one of the biggest company in the world that is involved in a genetically modified product is Monsanto. Now, if you Google search Monsanto, Monsanto is a chemical company, right? It's a chemical company. And you, will, you must be wondering, what does a chemical com company got to do with agriculture? Well, they are one of the leading company involved in genetic, genetically modified crops. Now, I tell you what, what I mean. Why, what, what does it mean? A genetically modified crop means from their justification is number one, you can produce, let's say take rice, paddy, rice. Huh? If let's say normal, you have got two, two, uh, three, uh, two times a year, you can do the crop normal. But genetically modified, you can do four to six times. That means the cycle of planting and harvesting becomes shorter, number one. That means what? The volume of production will be high. Oh, that's good. We can feed a lot of people. Very good. Number two, the rice can last longer. It has got longer shelf life. That means now rice can last about one to two years normal. Anything beyond that, depending on the rice, anything beyond that becomes powder, cannot use already. But genetically modified rice can last for three to six years or more. Number three, genetically modified uh, crops, paddy, you do not need to have pesticides. You know, you want to keep your pest away. In most farmers, they have to chase all kinds of insects, birds, and whatever not. Here, you don't have to. Why? Because the, pro the plant itself has certain kind of repellent that repels all these uh, repellent that will keep all these insects, uh, birds away. Now, just imagine. If it keeps the birds away, if it keeps insects away, and you are going to consume them, is it okay? Birds stay away from that. Insects stay, stay away from that. Even rats stay away from that. But then they say it's good for you. Now, think about it. So these are issues. All companies are one of the biggest polluters in the world. Are they ethically conducting their oil activity? Logging firms, you know logging? Logs, timber, all right? It's happening all over the world. So are they ethically logging? Or are they just destroying tropical forests, whatever? What is the implication? Palm oil companies, I'm sure this is one of the biggest controversy because some of the biggest palm oil companies in the world are Malaysian companies, fortunately or unfortunately. But they are contributors towards the destruction of, uh, of, of forests in, in whichever country they operate or even in Malaysia for that matter. So that is corporate level ethical question. The third one is what we call a systemic level ethical question. Ethical questions about the social, political, legal, or economic systems within which companies operate. So this one talks about governance. The role of the government in making sure that there is justice, there is equity, all right? There is fairness. This is the role of the government. So, Individual level, business corporate level, and at the systemic level, which is at the government level. So only if all these three levels are consistent and can see the same thing, only then you can establish a just society. If any one of this, at any point of time, if they do not perform, do not conduct themselves ethically, the whole system collapses. So that means to say that there must be high level of consciousness about what is, what are the right thing to do, what are the wrong thing to do, what we should do, what we should not do. To preserve mankind today, to preserve mankind in the future, to preserve the earth as it is today, and to preserve Earth for the future as well. So this is a perspective. Okay? All right. So when you talk about business ethics, there are people who say ethics and uh, business and ethics cannot mix. They are two different things. Why? 
The justification is in a free market economy, the pursuit of profit will ensure maximum social benefit. So business ethics is not needed. That means if you allow companies to freely operate, the assumption is, Adam Smith, the assumption is there would eventually, it would eventually lead to equilibrium. That means it will naturally happen if you allow free market economy. That's one, one, one justification. Second justification is so long as companies obey the law, they will do all that ethics requires. So if you conform to law, you follow the law, you're okay, you're ethical, but not necessary. You may conform to the law, but you may still be unethical. For example, all right, if, if, you, if, you are, if you are a timber company, logging company, the law says for every, uh, for every one uh, timber you chop down, you must replant, um, what do you call it, a 10, um, uh, 10 fresh plants. You have to replant 10. But a company may, may replant, not 10, but they only replant five. Or instead of five, uh, instead, they may replant 10, but they replant the wrong plant. No point at all. You understand that? So these are things that happens. Pollution. In fact, every factory will have some level of pollution. But the question is, the government says you can only, uh, you can only uh, uh, emit X amount of smoke in the, in the environment. But the question is, if you are below, you are still polluting, but only thing lesser. So it doesn't justify in that sense, right? Okay. Then a manager's most important obligation is loyalty to the company, regardless of ethics. That means if you are working for a company, eventually all of you are going to work for the company. The assumption is if you're paid to do a job, you just do your job. You don't talk about ethics. Your pursuit is to make money. That's it. Your company, your business, your, your bosses say, I want you to maximize profit. That's it. So why should I bother about ethics? Okay. There's arguments against Business ethics. That means we don't need to talk about ethics. We don't talk about social justice. Okay? Then, arguments supporting business ethics. Now, we all know, number one, ethics applies to all human activities. We always want to do good things. We want to preserve harmonious relationship with our friends, with our relatives, with everybody. So, the, the relationship itself must be sincere, ethical, ethical relationship. And number two, business cannot survive without ethics. If you don't have a code of honor, who's going to trust you? Nobody's going to trust you. You must have some level of uh, what do you call it, code of honor. And to a larger extent, ethics is consistent with profit making, profit seeking. If you produce safe product, if you produce healthy product, people consume, people will come back to you again. But if you produce unsafe product, unhealthy product, you're going to lose business on the long term. Perhaps you may make money on the short term, but on the long term, you may lose money. So it's a total waste. Number four, customers, employees, and people in general care about ethics. I want my employer to take care of me. If my employer takes care of me, I will take care of my employer's business. Reciprocity. If the employer exploits the employee, do you think that you are going to do a good job? No, you won't do a good job. You expect your employer to treat you fairly, pay you according to what you, uh, your effort. But if your employer is treating you badly, then of course you also would show your, your anger, your frustration in some way, okay? And studies suggest ethics does not detract from profits and it seems to contribute to profits. One of the studies now shows the most ethical companies are the most profitable companies. I'm gonna show you later. I'm gonna give you examples of three companies who are highly ethical and how they are very successful. So people, the assumption, the old notion saying that 
Business and ethics cannot mix. It's a myth. Remember that. It can connect. It can work together. And it can lead to higher profitability. Right? Okay. Now, Adam Smith, I'm sure all of you have done uh, economics, right? Adam Smith's capitalism says, market competition ensures the pursuit of self-interest in markets and advances the public welfare. Meaning to say what? You have done this in your economics 101, huh? very basic. If you allow fair competition, it will eventually benefit the people. Because companies, organization will try to perform the best way possible to serve the needs and wants of customers, consumers. Because if they don't, somebody else will do it. So according to Adam Smith, just leave it be. It'll be fine. And he says government interference in markets lowers public welfare by creating shortages or surpluses. That means he says that no government interference is required. But, uh, but interestingly, if government does not intervene today, let's look at today. In your country, in my country, in Malaysia, the government provides all kinds of incentives, subsidies, in order to keep the price down. If let's say the oil price, if the government doesn't give subsidy or does not give incentive, the price of oil will be so expensive that most people can't afford. So that means government interference is necessary. If government interference is not there, they're going to have a problem. Okay. Thirdly, private ownership leads to a better care and use of resources than common ownership. Why, why should it be? You see, when you talk about private ownership, they talk about two things, effectiveness and efficiency. And sometimes when you look at effectiveness and efficiency, it can also mean exploitation. So Adam Smith's justification for a capitalist economy has its, also, has its flaws as well. And that is what has brought about to whatever we are facing today, which we're going to talk about shortly. All right? Everybody is so gung-ho, so uh, obsessed with profit-making. And they sideline the importance, sideline the relevance of a just society because there would be an element of exploitation somewhere. Okay. Now, this is Adam Smith. The opposite of Adam Smith is who? Marx, socialism or communism. All right. Marx, on the other hand, is the other extreme. He says that everything must be centrally controlled. There should not be any private property. Everything should be collectively owned. There must be central planning so that you can create, uh, so that you can identify gaps and plug the gaps. And he says that only the government would know what is best for the people. But unfortunately, as you all know, except for China, which is still standing, Vietnam, which is still standing, Cuba, which is still standing, Laos, which is still standing, all other communist countries have failed. All other communist countries have moved away from communism and gone into other form of governance. Because why they moved? Because it failed. China says it's not. China says it's working for them, but they also have got issues. It's just that they don't want to admit it at this point of time. But if you look at all the other communist countries, Soviet Union, the largest, the biggest, at one time, the biggest communist country in the world. Soviet Union, today, Soviet Union does not exist. The entire union collapsed and all countries became independent. Russia is the only country, uh, Russia is a, a country by itself. And it is also not a communist country anymore. The entire Eastern European countries which used to be communist, no longer communist because the century plan system did not work. So the lesson we learn here is extreme form of capitalism and extreme form of socialism does not work. Both has its evil. Both creates its own problems. Both creates ethical issues. And ethical issues or ethical problems are the one that leads to uh, leads to affecting the harmony, leads to affecting 
the, the, the creation of a just society. Right? Okay. So, when we talk about um, cooperation, right? When we talk about cooperation, the, the corporate level uh, uh, issues, one of the things that we always ask is, why is there corrupt practice occurring everywhere? Why is there a corrupt practice occurring? And this is not something that is connected to any one country, any one company. You find that this is a common problem everywhere. Even in the US, you have got problems, corrupt practices. In Japan, you have got corrupt practices. Malaysia, governance itself was an issue, isn't it? I'm sure all of you know the former prime minister of Malaysia has been uh, sentenced for corrupt practice owing to uh, um, you know, poor governance and corrupt practice. So it's a perennial problem. So the question is, why is it happening? It's happening because of what we call the fraud triangle. People commit corrupt act. Uh, people commit corrupt act because, number one, owing to pressure. Pressure owing to what? Because of what, what kind of pressure? Financial or emotional force pushing towards fraud. You need the money. So you need the extra money. So you go extra mile, conduct yourself un, uh, in a corrupted manner in order to accept bribery. That's one. Or you are forced to by everybody in the system. You have to, no choice. You must accept money. Possible. Number one, pressure. Number two, opportunity. Where you have the ability to execute the plan without being caught. You know nobody will, nobody will know. You cheat here, nobody will know. You know, there's a case of a bank employee in Malaysia. You know what he did? In every account, big accounts, eh? I'm talking about big accounts in the bank. He was working in a bank. He just minus off one cent every day. One cent. If it's a big account where a company has got millions of dollars, you take out one cent, would it make a difference now? Can you see anywhere? You can't see. Every day, he take out from different accounts, big accounts, one cent, one cent. He, he became a millionaire himself. Eventually, the, uh, the bank, you know, looked at his lifestyle and found that his lifestyle does not conform to the salary he earns. Then he was caught, investigated caught. All right? So opportunity to, so if you're in power, you have an opportunity to, to, to uh, conduct yourself, uh, uh, conduct corruptly. All right? Okay. Rationalization. Personal justification of dishonest action. The, the most common thing people will say is, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. If I don't take the money, somebody else is going to take the money. My answer, I take the money. Personal justification. Or you may say, after all, it's just a small amount. No, no big deal. It's not going to make anybody uh, uh, you know, poorer. So I just take the money. Personal justification. So these are the common reasons why people, whether at individual, whether at corporate, whether at systemic, commit corrupt practice. And fundamentally, if you go down further, you find that they have very low conscious consciousness. They have very low awareness of ethics and implication of unethical behavior. That's the problem. All right? They have very low consciousness, very low awareness of ethical conduct and the implication of unethical conduct. That's why. All right. And one thing I can tell you, all right, if you look at Indonesia, Indonesia at one point of time, I mean, you don't have to get offended, but it's a fact. Indonesia at one point of time was considered to be one of the most corrupt country in the world. Once upon a time, huh? long, long time ago. But today, Indonesia has moved away from that, far away from that. Today, Indonesia has proven, right? Indonesia has proven that if you have the right leader, you can change the whole thing. You can reverse the whole thing. 
today in the corruption index, Malaysia ranks very high, eh? but Indonesia ranks very low. That means they're considered to be less corrupted than Malaysia. Why? Because the top, all right? If the top is willing, if the top is serious, if the top person is, uh, is uh, what do you call that, um, committed, everything can change, all right? So that is why you can see changes happening in your country, definitely. You can see changes. In fact, even companies today who want to go to Indonesia, unlike in the past, is easy way in, easy way out, but no more already. It's no longer easy way in, easy way out. The regulations are strict, no longer easy. All right, authorities are very, very stringent. Authorities are making sure that things, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, whatever happens, all right, happens within the confines of the law, okay? So I want you to be aware of this, okay? All right. So today, we are, with all this happening in the world, corporations today are forced to move to a new era. This era is called the age of corporate social justice. So corporate social justice is a framework regulated by the trust between a company and its employees, customers, shareholders, and the broader community it touches with the goal of explicitly doing good by all, all of them. So corporate social justice requires deep integration with every aspect of the way a company functions. That means it is a holistic, committed, dedicated effort in order to create a win-win situation with all the stakeholders in a business ecosystem. It is not win-lose. You know, in the past, it's win-lose. Win to the company, lose to, them, uh, to the customers. Win because they make more profit, lose because they get lower quality or, or poor quality product. Win to the, custom, uh, to the company, uh, uh, lose to the employees because the employer make more money, but the employee's salary is very low. Not equitable salary, problem. But in, a, in the age of corporate social justice, we are talking about a win-win situation. That means every stakeholder has equal importance in the business equation. That's important. Customer is equally important as the stakeholder, uh, as the shareholder. Shareholder is equally important as the public. The public is equally important as the employees. Employees equally important as the planet. So we are looking at a, at a holistic approach. Okay, all right. So the current perspective of uh, on, on corporate social justice says many enterprises today are reorienting strategies in order to serve the needs of a broader set of stakeholders especially in circumstances where government has seemingly been unable to provide solution. In the past, any social issues, any social problems, economic problems, we always look at the government for solution. But sometimes the government itself may not have all the means to deal with this. So this is where the role of cooperation comes in. The cooperation comes in as to assist the government to assist the community, assist society in order to solve social issues, economic issues, whatever. And that's important. Look at during a crisis, like there's a tsunami or whatever, look at the number of companies come in to help. If without the private sector involvement, the government alone cannot cope with the magnitude of the crisis. Right? Indonesia itself, in the past have went, has gone through various crises, including tsunami, earthquakes, and whatever not. And, and every time it happens, you find that not only the government comes in, but the private sector also comes in to assist. That's important, all right? So we are looking at a, a, a broader perspective, making sure all stakeholders are equally committed to create a just society, right? Okay. So, corporate, so hence, all right, corporate social justice requires organization to deeply integrate, integrate, integrate how they are behaving internally to how they behave externally. That means both internal behavior and external behavior must be consistent. 
It's built to create a positive society change, positive societal change. It becomes, uh, it becomes then a necessity of how an organization operates, not just a marketing strategy. So sometimes you, we talk about CSR, corporate social responsibility. I'm sure all of you know, I've heard of a term, corporate social responsibility. But corporate social responsibility sometimes can be also used as a marketing tool. Oh, I've done this. Then you go promote, tell the whole world. I've donated so much of money to this uh, for this particular social activity, and you use that as a platform to what do you call it uh, to 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 boost your sales. Wrong. But in 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 corporate in a in a CSR sorry in corporate social justice that's not the thing. You genuinely want to make a change. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, companies, corporations need to align their activities. So this kind of evolution may require a cultural shift. That means mindset. That means people must say, hey, look, I want to make a change. I want to make a difference. I want to commit myself. I want to behave ethically. Huh? Before it can begin any sort of corporate social justice, let me start with you and I. You and I have to make the change. Employees have to make the change. All right. At the very least, it may require a truly transparent look at how the organization represents the kind of change it is looking to make. That means there must be transparency. It must be clear which direction. For example, Body Shop. I'm sure all of you have, you all know of Body Shop, right? It's available in Indonesia as well. Body Shop is a company that was established by, by a lady called Anita Rodik. Anita Rodik is a housewife. From a housewife, she built a multi-billion dollar business. And there were two things that she was concerned of. Corporate mission, philosophy. Number one, the product that they, they, they produce must be natural product. No chemicals. That's why if you look at body shop products, it has got a very short shelf life, not long shelf life. You buy those chemical shampoo, can last you for you, the, the shelf life, it can be like three months, uh, three years. But body shop, maybe three to six months only because they don't use chemical. Number one, natural product. Number two, Anita Rodik also believed in women emancipation. She wants to help, she wants to emancipate, uplift poor, impoverished women in different parts of the world. So, Whatever product supplies that, uh, whatever ingredients that uh, a body shop uses, uh, whatever ingredients that body shop uses are sourced from farmers who are female farmers in impoverished countries. Not big farm, some corporation, no. The idea here is to help women to uplift themselves socially and economically. So that means Body Shop is a company that already had that kind of perspective in mind. That means one is to make sure they produce healthy, safe product, natural product. And number two, at the same time, wants to emancipate women. All right? So it's not impossible. It is possible. It's being done. Right? Okay. Now, to give you an example. All right? To give you an example. Now, one company that I can give you, I'm going to give three examples. This is the first example. This example is what they call a company called Organic India. All right. Organic India is a global wellness company. It's on the quest to improve ethical and enterprise not only can exist in the modern world, but can thrive. How? How is, this, how is it possible? Okay. Now, look at this. The story of Organic India. Number one, putting people and the planet before profits is a fundamental principle of Organic India. That means priority is people and planet, not profit. Number two, they now work with 2,000 rural farmers to cultivate over 10,000 acres of organic farm in India, whereby the farmers and tribal wildcrafters are guided by the company in organic and agroecological practices. That means it is not exhaustive. Whatever they do is part of the eco ecology of the of the of the of the uh, environment where they operate. Farmers are taught how to do organic farming by the company. The harvested crops and herbs at premium market price, ensuring sustainable income for their farmers, and even the fee for organic certification is borne by the company. That means the company provides everything. 
Their commitment goes beyond the farm by providing access to healthcare, gender equality programs, infrastructure improvement. So all these are given by the company to these 2,000 rural farmers living in rural area. And Organic India has a net worth about USD $100 million. Right? So it's possible and it's a very good company. In fact, I, I, I also subscribe to this company because I buy some of the products they make. Because I know that if I buy this product, I'm actually helping a farmer. Why not? I'm also, by buying their product, I'm also, I also know that the farm is being ethically farmed. Not using fertilizer, not using a chemical, whatever, all are, you know, natural. So they're not harming the earth. Why not? Okay. All right. Next company. Bank of Montreal. It's a Canadian company located in Canada. And this is one of the oldest bank, 200 year old, no? not, not, not very young bank, 200 year old bank. Bank of Montreal financial group has been recognized as one of the world's most ethical companies for the fourth consecutive year by Ethisphere. Ethisphere is a, is, a, is a monitoring body, ethical monitoring body a global leader in defining and advancing the standards of ethical business practices. So what do they do? It's a bank, eh? number one, surpassing its goal to align 250 billion in client investment with sustainable objectives. That means their customers, they have actually channeled $250 billion into sustainable activity. That's big. Achieving 71% of its commitment to mobilize 150 billion in capital by 2025 to companies pursuing sustainable objectives. That means they provide loans, assistance, and whatever not for those companies who are involved in sustainable activities. Reaching 64% of its commitment to doubling the size of the bank's indigenous banking business by 2025. Who are the indigenous? These are, these are the people who live, these are tribals. Indigenous are tribals in different parts of the world. In the U, in 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 uh, what do you call it? in the U.S. and some other parts of uh, North America, increasing the representation of blacks, uh, African American, indigenous, and people of color by twenty percent. Right? Interesting. It, to senior positions, that means they have a you see discrimination happens everywhere, right? Discrimination happens everywhere, and one of the most discriminated people in the US, uh, African-American, colored people, and so on. So they help them out, making sure that they push them to a higher level, right? 41.9% of senior leadership roles are held by women. Women are always have problems, glass ceiling. They only can go up to a certain point. After that, all men only take over. But Bank of Montreal says no. Equality. If promotion is based on merits, if a female... Uh, a, a woman can do a particular job and it's qualified, they give them a job, All right? So 41.9% of senior leadership role in Bank of Montreal are held by women. Interesting. More than 40% of independent board roles are held by women. Gender equality. More than 30% of uh, senior roles are held by uh, 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 black, indigenous, and people of color, All right? So these are some of the changes that's already happening. And this is a very, very profitable company. One of the oldest and one of the most, one of the, you know, one of the most profitable companies in the world. So that means it's working. You cannot say it can't work, it's working. All right. So, so therefore, all right, therefore, when you talk about corporate social justice, you must have a clear goal, you must have a vision. That's very important. The company must have clear vision, uh, sorry, clear goal, clear vision about what they want to do, how they want to do, why they want to do, what differences are they, uh, do they want to make important. Then thoughtfully situate your company within the broader ecosystem surrounding the goal. That means you must be conscious about your ecosystem. Where are you? What are you doing? Who are your stakeholders? What are their expectations on you? What can you do? to make uh, 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 the relationship meaningful, all right? Thirdly, build robust 
and representative working groups that connect the company with st stakeholders. That means you must have an engagement program with your stakeholders, with the public, with the customers, with the employees, whoever. And more importantly, you must take a stance. Take a stance means you must take a stand. I want to make the change. I, I My company wants to make a, a difference. We want to establish social social justice with our, with, with amongst uh, our stakeholders. So you must take a stand. And once you make a stand, once you execute a plan, then you have to regularly evaluate your progress. How you want to, are you doing the right thing? Are you progressing in the right direction? Is it really bringing benefit to the, to the, to the of, uh, what do you call that, to, to, to the society that you're operating? So all these are broader perspective. But remember, at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, it is very important that whatever you do, whatever a company does, it is not just about profit, but there are bigger agenda that you need to look at. And that is what we call the social agenda. All right, so thank you. So I'm not going to say more because uh, the time is short, uh, because I, I tried to uh, frame it as, as concise as possible so that uh, you are able to uh, appreciate and my, my objective today is to create awareness, all right? Not to ask you to go and reflect, not asking you to go and, sorry, not asking you to go and analyze, no. I want to create awareness that there is such a thing as corporate social justice and companies, organizations are actually moving in that direction now, globally. All right, okay. Thank you very much. If there's any question, I can take on. Maybe you can type the question. Yeah, thank you for this, uh, Rafi, for sharing your knowledge. Yeah, maybe for our audience, if you want to ask questions, you can write in room chat or you can raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, so waiting, we have four questions from our audience in YouTube. Sure, I will share in room chat for four for, for questions from our no, audience. Stop sharing. Okay, you can, uh, yeah. Okay, next way, let me just see that. Okay, justice uh, relates to putting everything in its place or it can also be said to be harmony between portions and placing things in their place. What do you think is the way to create impartial justice within the company, right? Now, when you say impartial justice, of course, it always has to start from the top. That means the top management must be committed, all right, must be committed to pursue uh, so uh, to pursue justice within the company. It cannot be a case of imposing or expecting people who are downline, all right, or, or, or uh, people at different level, expecting them to conform, but the top management does not. That means it has to cascade top down. That's the only way. Because too often you find that uh, um, uh, companies comes out with policies and so on, but these policies only meant for lower level employees. But the board of directors, they themselves are not conform, are, con, con, uh, are not, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, either not willing, all right, or not covered. Like as though they are a different group, they don't have to worry about that. So to me, I would say it has to cascade down leadership by example. It has to come from the top. That means you, the, the top management have to similarly prescribe those uh, prescription to themselves and not just uh, channeling it to other people, other levels, but not to themselves. So that's the first, first thing I would say, all right? Only then it'll be impartial, all right? Okay. Number two question is companies in business activities can create jobs by producing products and services needed by the community and make a large contribution to economic development. But on the other hand, the company also has a negative impact on the nature and people around it. 
such a waste, uh, such as waste pollution into rivers, soil erosion, others, whether there is treatment to overcome the problem, or at least reduce the negative impact of the company or on nature and people. Okay, I think fundamentally this is the question itself actually has got an answer. The question is that got an answer. The sense that the company first and foremost must have awareness. They belong to a particular ecosystem. Anything they do or do not do have direct implication to that ecosystem. So things like waste, pollution, is they are doing, they are in control of that. So if you are in control of that, therefore, you can do something about it. But you cannot just expect the government, expect other parties to regulate. This is where self-regulation comes in. You have to self-regulate. You have to, the company itself must have their own benchmark. Only then it will work. You don't have to wait for the government to say, okay, we are going to set new, uh, uh, new regulation, you have to conform. No, 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 it's not like that. It means that the company itself has to come up with their own uh, uh, self-regulation, their own benchmark to manage, um, to manage uh, 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 what is that, um, uh, manage themselves within the particular ecosystem, particularly you mentioned about waste and pollution and so on, right? That, that's what I think, right? Uh, number three, what if a company decided to make a product for the better of the world, but in fact, in the future, it will have negative impact to the world? Example, DDT, pesticide. How to apply corporate social justice? Technically speaking, DDT should, in fact, many countries already ban DDT. You can't use it. Some countries are illegally using it. Some, some companies are illegally using it, but DDT is bad. DDT is bad. What is It's pesticide. So why do you need such kind of pesticide when there are various other methods, various other uh, non-harmful methods? So, so DDT itself, all right, is injustice, doing injustice, not to only the, uh, more importantly, the injustice done to the people who are using that. In fact, long, long time ago, in fact, it was the, in the, the, the workers' plantation, workers' union in Malaysia, lobbied to the government to impose a complete ban on DDT. Because... Employers, all right, the plantation companies were very easy. They look for the easy way out, cheapest way out to kill pests. So DDT was fine. But DDT has a implication to the health of the plantation workers. So it was very clear. Plantation companies at that time, until, the, until 1975, they were very exploitative. But because of the lobby, because of the... Uh, the plantation workers union or I brought up this issue to the government later it was banned. So to me, I would say anything that has long-term negative implication should not be allowed in the first place, should not be done at all. Though it may have a short-term benefit, but if it has got long-term negative consequences, then it should be avoided at all costs, right? Okay. Now, another question. What do you think about new trend of electricity car, electric car, while, while it, it green technology? It's not so green because they need battery, nickel, lithium, yes. It's all have to mine and make ecological destruction. Absolutely, I agree with you. I agree with this person, whoever the person asks this question, absolutely agree with you. All right? You are, you are merely shifting the problem, but not solving the problem. You say, um, uh, what is that? Uh, um, a fuel combustion engine is polluting, you know, a, a fuel, uh, uh, what is that? A carbon dioxide, all that is polluting and so on. So you switch to um, EVs. EVs are clean, no pollution. But the problem is not the engine. The problem is the battery. The entire process uh, all right, of 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 um, of uh, produce uh, of making this battery using nickel and lithium. These are all very harmful to the. In fact, the the mining of this plus the processing of this causes a lot of environmental degradation. In fact, new research, new new um, new um, what do you call that uh, studies have shown that um, the damage caused by by uh, by the mining of lithium, nickel, and, uh, and, and processing of nickel, uh, nickel and, and lithium is more harmful than the fuel, fuel uh, pollutants, more harmful. So maybe Indonesia must be very careful 
because Elon Musk is coming here, all right? I hope that Elon Musk is not going to take advantage of the situation. So now what's going to happen is Indonesian government has to come up with their own policy to say, hey, look, fine, but these are the regulations, these are the conditions, right? So, so um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Maybe they should look at other alternatives. Maybe they could look at hydrogen fuel using converting water into a fuel, possible, which is even cleaner as well. So I, I do not see, I personally do not see the production of batteries using lithium, the current technology in, 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 um, in, uh, uh, for, for electric vehicles is sustainable. I personally do not think it's not sustainable. All right, definitely it's not sustainable. All right, so companies have to look at alternatives, but this technology itself is definitely not sustainable. I agree with you. And then we have last question from Sahrul Ar Ardani. Also, okay. Yeah. Well, the question is, how can we be patient and believe in the process to build a company? What is your question? I don't understand. It. How can we be patient and believe in the process to build a company? I mean, it's what? I, I don't, I, what, what, what's your question actually? Can, can you cl clarify your question? Okay. What? Maybe for Sahrul Ardani, you can ask him. Sharul Adani, can you clarify your question? I would like to know. I would like to answer the question, but I really do not know what exactly you're asking for. Maybe we can. Oh, meaning, meaning I, I think so. It's like this. I, I think. Let me let me let me decipher. What you're saying is building a company or, or, or establishing a company takes a long time. So you have to be patient, all right, to do that. Now, let me tell you one thing. I think uh, the other day, Dr. Kishan spoke to you about uh, being an entrepreneur and all that. Now, I, my advice to you as an entrepreneur is very simple. Whatever business that you want to start up, doesn't matter what, now, whatever business you want to start, make sure that business or that area or field is something that you are interested, passionate about. Something that you like. Don't go into business because there's a potential to make a lot of money. Sometimes people go into business and they say, hey, you know what, this business, I can make a lot of money. Let's go and pump money. And let's... That is wrong. That is where you become very exasperated when things doesn't work out the way that you think. But if you choose a business that you may have interest, you are passionate about, the word patience will never come because it is part of what you like to do. So it will naturally, you'll be just going on and on trying to perfect it or making it better. So, so as a, a, a future entrepreneurs or, or if you have any intention of, of uh, setting up a business, all right, whatever that may be, look at your own interests, look at your own passion. Maybe you like, uh, you like to go, you know, you like to, uh, what is that? You like farming or you like agriculture, then go into agriculture business. Maybe you like uh, electronics, you know, like to dabble with computer, whatever, then go into that, doesn't matter. So don't go into business because it can make a lot of money. That is no. Money can be made any, can be made many ways. If you go into a business that you're passionate about, while making money, you're also going to be very happy. But if you go into business because you want to make money only and not passionate about, then you're going to be very, very miserable. Especially when things do not work out the way that you plan. Now, have I answered your question? I don't know whether that's what you are asking. I hope I've answered your question. Okay. Yeah. I think we don't have no. Wait, wait, wait. Maybe for our audience, if you want to ask question again, you can write in the chat or you can raise your hand before I close this session today. Okay. Well, maybe we don't have no more question again, sir. Can I continue this session to closing? Okay. Good. Finally, we come. Finally, we come to the end of visiting lecture. Even today, we would like to say thanks again for Mr. Rafi Farman Kaniapan from Help University for their information will be beneficial for our audience. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. It's so very beneficial, and I hope we can meet again at other event in our future with other collaboration with Help University in Malaysia. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, I was very happy.
and hope that all your participants benefited from my short uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, but sure, can we take a picture for documentation? I will yeah, sure, sure. take a sure. new in our web chat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so much for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Goodbye.